the Glacier Conservancy. Um, and it's my pleasure to host tonight. Um, our executive director, Doug Mitchell, is on vacation. So we're going to miss him. But I have Grace Kinsler helping me out tonight. Um, Andrew Smith is going to watch the chat for us um, and ask um, all of your really great questions. Stacey Dubuque is here. She's our donor, um, I'm sorry, our um, director of development. So I'm happy to have her um, and all of you. Um, our featured book tonight, as you all know, is Wild River Pioneers, the second edition. Um, and I think we can all agree it's about legends and celebrities, large personalities and the color of colorful history that shaped Glacier, the Flathead, um, and specifically the Middle Fork Valley. Um, and I would say that legend also applies to the author who is sitting next to me. Um, and sometimes we come a little bit in and out. That's part of our magic tonight. Um, we'll try to sit still. Um, John Fraley, thank you for being here tonight and for sharing with us. This is great. It's, it's really an honor because I worked so long on getting all the research and interviewing people and visiting sites. And to have this many people interested, it's just a it's just a joy for me to do this. So I really appreciate it. So great. Um, so folks who are on, um, and many of you have been on before, as I said, but tonight is very much meant to be a conversation. Um, John would be thrilled if we could um, all sort of engage in conversation, either through the chat or just uh, raising your hand or just shouting out questions as we talk through this. Um, we came up with a bunch of questions, um, many from John himself, and, and we're of course going to hear about the process of writing the book and, and all of his great stories, but please feel free to just unmute or to raise your hand um, or to ask a question in the chat. And as always, at some point, we'll take a little break and do a giveaway. Um, John has brought a couple of books, um, Wild Rivers Pioneers, as well as Rangers, um, Trappers and Trailblazers to give away. And we also have a, have a Glacier Conservancy Fox t-shirt. So we'll do that a little bit later. Um, I'm gonna kick things off with a few questions and I hope that you will all join in. Um, and I guess, John, I would love to hear about, just sort of about you. Um, you've been around this area for a while um, and it seems like you do a little bit of everything. Well, you, you were asking me earlier what I did today. Um, and today I went over and jogged up to the top of uh, Apgar Lookout and back. And I saw this one group of three folks. They were coming down as, uh, and, and they said, yeah, we got close, but we didn't quite make it. And I found out where they went to. They were like a quarter mile from the top when they turned yeah. around. <clears throat> so that's unfortunate. But I always like to connect the glacier by experience, that, especially when I'm going to give a talk about it. And you asked me about a little bit my my background. <clears throat> well, I worked for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks for almost 40 years. And I've been an adjunct instructor at Flathead Valley Community College for 36 years. And I've always been interested in history and biology. And I was the biologist in the Middle Fork of the Flathead for a long time. And I still do some volunteer work in there. So that's how it kind of first got me started. Um, and specifically to this book, um, why did you write the book? What got you started? Well, my original, my first book is called A Woman's Way West. And we did a book club on that a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and the person in that book is Doris Huffine. And Doris knows all the characters up the Middle Fork. And I was, I was uh, over in the Middle Fork one day and, and I, I saw this, this wrecked kind of a homestead. And as soon as I got back across the river and because the park is on the other side of the river, I came back and talked to uh, Doris who was kind of my mentor. This was in the eighties. I said, Doris, what's with that big homestead over there? Oh, that's Josephine Duty spot. Josephine was a bootlegger. I used to, to know her really well because I owned the Stanton Creek Lodge and we would talk with her when we drove back and forth to Kalispell. And so that's what started me on the bootleg lady of Glacier Park story, which is one of the, the main stories in Wild River Pioneers. I see. Okay. So, in, and we just sort of had a conversation about the, not wanting to lose the history of this place. Yeah. And actually, you know, I can hear Doris's voice now. You got to talk to Tiny Powell. You got to talk to Velma Guy. Um, she told me all the people to talk to to interview about Josephine, and that was in this was in the '80s. And so I went through as soon as as, you, as any of you the book known uh, written a book know as soon as you interview one person, they give you two or three other example or ideas to interview somebody else. And so pretty soon I was interviewing dozens of people for the Josephine Duty story, which if you've read the book, you know is a very uh, it's a very crazy story. 
And I remember counting it up. And by the time that book was published, nearly every single one of the people I interviewed had died. And so that shows you that if you're trying to encapsulate that history of the old timers, get it now. If you have some old timers in your life, get it down now. And I remember, I remember Bill McGuire. Bill McGuire was a person that knew Josephine really well when Josephine lived on the Forest Service side of the, of the river. And she said, uh, and, and I, I found out where she was. She was in a, a uh, was the Brendan house, which is a place where it's like assisted living. And she wasn't doing well. And I, <clears throat> I walked in to her room and I took her some flowers. And she said, what she said to me was, it's terminal. And she died within a month of when I interviewed her. And she's, she's a lot of her information is in um, Wild River Pioneers. So that's just one example. I don't know how many people I interviewed for that, uh, that story about Josephine. So you just got to get on and dig. And, you know, some old timers will talk to you and they'll want to share. And then some won't, won't as much. So and then, of course, the park archives, um, old uh, newspaper articles are a really good source, uh, things like that. Were a lot of these people that you were interviewing still around the flathead or, or was it a mix? <clears throat> well, they were at the time. I mean, the Robertson family, for example, was uh, still prominent in the Middle Fork. Most of them have, many of them have passed now. Betty the Trapper, who's in this book, um, passed in 2015. Um, and so a lot of the people that were there, you know, after Josephine, but still knew her when they were like, maybe they were children and she was an adult. Um, we're still there. So there was a, a pretty good tie back to the actual people that made the history there. Yeah, and again, when we were talking earlier, I mean, this process has taken 30 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because when I did, I started researching, I wrote my first article about Doris Huffine in, in 1989. And I was moving on into the Josephine Duty story because of her telling me all these different things. And on her deathbed in 1990, she did the final review of what became the Josephine Duty chapter. I actually published it in True West magazine, but Doris was reading through it, sitting on her bed in Brendan House. And I remember uh, I would go in there and I said, Doris, what do you want? What do you really want? I know I can't break you out of here. Well, actually what I really want is a order of McDonald fries and a you know, chocolate milkshake. <laughs> so I, so I, I went to McDonald's and got her those and stuck them into the, um, into the Brandon house and gave them to her. Now it's, she died within a week of that, but I don't think it was the, cause she had terminal cancer. But, <clears throat> but at any rate, um, she was a big part of what started me on this. And, you know, it, it took till 2008 before I published uh, the original version of Wild River Pioneers. And I've added a lot to it. This is, this new edition is really, really, really uh, superior to the old one. <clears throat> Uh, and, and so was that sort of your impetus for, to writing the second one, to adding to it? You just knew that you had a bunch more information to share. Yeah, I, was, I almost considered writing a book called What Happened to the Pioneers or a section on my next mm -hmm. book. But then we decided to do Far Country, agreed to do a whole new um, edition of it. And so we just revised the whole thing. And then I think the, the uh, epilogue now is about 33 pages. So it's all the things that happened to the characters that you read about in the first version. So if you've got the new version, then you've got that. And, you know, so many things, you know, that's found some gravestones, found some burial sites, uh, tried some spiritual connections with Josephine, all kinds of crazy stuff that's in that epilogue. Great. Well, it, it's such an easy, interesting, you, you can't wait to get to the next to finish that story and get on to the next one. So um, I think uh, maybe people in the chat can talk about what they thought of the book and just give uh, give John a few of your comments um, that he can walk away with um, and maybe that we can talk more about. That'd be well. great. I mean, is there anyone that would wanna say anything now or, or ask any questions or make any statements? Anybody? Do you have some questions in the chat? Um, start with. Carl and Candy ask, uh, how much artistic license did you take to fill in missing or vague parts of these stories? That is a great question because Bud Moore, who is my mentor, uh, he passed away in 2010 at age 93, worked for the Forest Service for 40 years. He was a great man. Um, he lived down the swamp and when he was doing his book, uh, The Loxa Story, and I was doing working on the book, uh, A Woman's Way West, and this original version of pioneers and he reviewed both books for me and way way he described it was 
okay, you got the factual information you know about, you know, and it's, you can decide how, how closely to, to uh, believe the newspaper accounts. I think mm. I've found them to be very accurate. At the, they're done at the time. They're probably one of your best sources. And then, you know, you've got death certificates. And then you, what you really need to do, which of course I did in my job and, after, and many other times, is you need to go out and visit the site and put the landscape, the story on the landscape and make sure it works. And what Bud told me was you got the stuff you know, then you got the things that are probably pretty solid. And then you have the part where you say, certainly they must have, quote unquote. So if they were in that area and they were gonna go around this, this uh, little glacier valley, like in the Penrose Mauling, certainly they went right through here and around there, even though I don't have actual photos or documentation of exactly where they went. So that's how I'd answer that. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but you, some of the stuff you do have to interpolate. And then we had another uh, question from Ed Wilson. He said, are actual trial transcripts from this time period still available? Yes, trial transcripts. Yeah, yeah. actually, um, in, in the, in the uh, story of the uh, murder of, of Lena Cunningham, I actually found the, um, the legal file with all the subpoenas and all the testimony and everything at the old courthouse from 1894. And so Lena was... Lena was, uh, she's buried not far from where we're sitting here, about a mile. And I couldn't find anything about her. You know, I just, all I had is the newspaper accounts that told the story of her murder. She was the first uh, person to be you know, murdered and one of the few people to ever be murdered in Columbia Falls. And I, I had just lucked into finding those. Uh, and, and yeah, it was all there. The, uh, all the, all the, the uh, subpoenas that the sheriff, sheriff uh, issued, the first sheriff of Flathead County, Gonier, who, uh, he never believed that that uh, Charlie Black was the killer. Mm -hmm. He never believed that, uh, but yet he hung Charlie Black. So it was a hard thing for him and his family. I just talked to his grandson, you know, while I was putting this book together, who's now passed away, but and he explained that to me that that uh, the sheriff never really thought <clears throat> that that Charles Black was the killer. And by the way, one of the things we did since the old version of Pioneers, and it's now in the new version, is that we. Uh, put a big monument up for the first year for Flathead County in the St. Mary Cemetery uh, in Missoula. So John Gagne, uh, Joe Gagnier has a big monument now, uh, partly funded by his grandson in, in fundraising. So those are some of the things we did there. Do you have an opinion about Charlie Black? <clears throat> nope. <laughs> <laughs> I well, had to ask. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm a scientist, so I think um, kind of on one side. And so when I see heavy circumstantial evidence it just seems like he's probably the one that did it but then on the other hand when the guy that did all the investigating and everything um didn't think he did it then it makes me wonder so i really i really don't know for sure and we never could find his his grave but we found lena's and <clears throat> the way we found it was incredible we uh so i called in, uh, uh the cemetery sexton at uh, uh pete darling and I had said, when I first uh, sort of finishing up Lena's story, and I said, you don't have a woman named Lena Cunningham buried there, do you? And he said, no, I've, I've looked through all the records here. I don't, and so hung up. And then about six hours later, he called me. <clears throat> I was actually at my office at Fishwell and Parks. And he said, yeah, we do have one, but I can't find her. I can't find her grave. I said, well, I'm coming over. So I came over. He had a metal detector. And he was going, you know, da -da 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 -da, like that, because there was some note in there that she might have been buried. And this was before the cemetery was even established. She might have been buried near the biggest ponderosa in that grove. Hmm. And so he's going, da -da -da -da, and did, 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 did. I thought, well, that's probably a can or something, you know. And he started digging. And then, then I got down and I started digging. And we were digging, digging, digging and uncovered the temporary marker, metal marker of Lena Cunningham, buried in 1894. And under, under a foot of sod the whole, you know, almost the whole time. It was one of the most incredible moments of my life. And, uh, you know, had, I had been working on the story for more than 10 years and finally found a physical tie to this poor woman. And apparently her whole family left Columbia Falls after she was killed, probably because they were just, you know, uh, so upset about it. Mm. And she never got anything but the temporary marker that soon got buried. And so now 
through Pete Darling and, and our efforts, she has a headstone. In the, and Chris Peterson did an article about it and um, her great, great nephew saw the article and contacted me and said, we didn't really even know the story of our own, whatever, great, 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 whatever she is, like aunt. And <clears throat> I remember when I got back to my office, I, <clears throat> this one time, and I looked at my computer, the email, and then I had an email from this guy named Woods. And it said, regarding Lena Cunningham. I thought, wow, I wonder what this is about. And I clicked on it. And the first sentence was, I am the great, great nephew of Lena Cunningham. And I just started crying because I've been working on this thing for 20 years. And now I had a tie and now I had a relative. And he was going to organize a party to come out here and retrace the whole murder route and try to figure out if she could have physically, if Black could have physically killed her and got back to the courthouse in time where he went out with the supposed uh, search party. But, but Keith Woods, but he never did get back to me after that. So that was, I don't remember what the question was now, but that's a long answer. <laughs> But that's the kind of thing you get into when you write a book like this. I mean, it just, it just, and the farther back you go, the more connections there are between people. Like Betty the Trapper got her little finger shot off when she was three years old. Well, the guy that operated on Betty the Trapper, Murphy, was the same guy that signed Josephine Duty's death certificate. And he also signed Silver Bill Morrison's death certificate. I mean, it's, they're all, there's so few people back then that you find the same people involved in some of the stories. Well, I can't imagine what it felt like to find those connections and to find a grave and yeah. to just find physical evidence. That was incredible. Um, yeah, after 20 years of, of sort of researching and searching. And don't forget to ask about George Snyder when we get there too, because there was a really fun one there. Nice, more to look forward to. <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> Andrew, what else do we have in the chat uh, there? Is there more? We have a, a comment from Bethany, uh, you know, in response to your asking uh, what people thought about the book. Uh, she said, what I think is so provocative is so much of the history you discuss in your book occurs upstream from US to and upstream from the Middle Fork many of us who live in the Valley are familiar with. It has inspired me to explore the path less traveled, so to speak. Wow, that's great. Well, I'll tell you, well, my number one recommendation is to, uh, you have to do it when the river's low, like now you could. And you go to Nyack Flats, you should probably go with someone who knows what they're doing. And you cross the river and you go over to the, du the Josephine Duty Homestead because it's still standing partly and a lot of it's down, but that would be number one. And then you can go up around Bear Creek Ranch near, not towards Marias Pass, and you can see the site of old McCarthyville. And if you actually hike in towards, um, uh, let's see, Oli Creek on the Fielding Trail, you can see some signs of the old Chinatown if you know where you're looking, but there's, you know, <clears throat> I just encourage everybody to go find their own stuff too. There's all kinds of things hidden up there. <laughs> I've heard the same thing about the park um, from some of the historians there. If you if you're looking around Lake McDonald Lodge or some of the other places, you can definitely find some historical artifacts. And uh, actually, what I mentioned about Chinatown, that's in Glacier Park. Okay. So you can't carry anything away or anything. You can look. That's around. right. You got to leave it all there. You just. <laughs> get to look. Take only memories, leave only footprints, right? That's right. Well, we had a question from Eric and Tanya Mullins. Uh, did you record the interviews uh, with any of these historical figures that so they could be deposited at, at a library or, or something like that? Yeah, all the <clears throat> all the Bud Moore stuff is high quality recordings. And actually I did some record some radio shows with him. So that's all on record. And then the Doris stuff, the stuff that's kind of in my my family, my wife's family, haven't deposited them yet, but I'm planning on doing that to the uh, Northwest Montana History Museum. But I did do a lot of recording um, so that I could <clears throat> transcribe it and then put the, put the words on the landscape. But yeah, you, you, you really need to do that too. I didn't record everything. I wish I would have, but uh, I did record a lot of it. And if you're going to, if hopefully this is going to make you think about collecting some of your own stories and, and you of your older relative, uh, loved ones, uh, make sure you record it. I, I, for my, my next couple books, my last couple books, I got a nice dictaphone and recorded everything. And then I gave the, the recording, you know, a copy of them on CDs to, uh, to their family to keep. And then I have it too. So probably not as good as I should be doing it, but I, it's, you know, it's just showing people that you care. A lot of people, they're really excited about it because I mean, think about, let's just think about yourself right now. 
How many of you think anybody cares to whether to record your information or how you probably think, oh, it's never going to come to anything. Well, that's probably what all these people thought, too. And look how it's added up to these some of these uh, crazy stories, you know. Yeah, yeah. what a great point. So what about as point. far as the historical information on Glacier and the Great Bear? Um, what was that process like or who did you talk to there? Well, at the Great Bear, I did a lot of um, fisheries work in there. So I was in, the, I was in the wilderness and walking up and down streams, I would see the old cabins. And so that sort of solidified the middle fork for me. And then, and then of course, newspaper, as I said, newspaper, the Colombian newspaper goes all the way back to the 1890s. And you, you'll be amazed at what you find there. I found the Baptiste, uh, some of the stuff about Baptiste claims and that that are in Rangers, Trappers, Trailblazers in that Colombian, it's all indexed now. It's just amazing. So uh, but the Glacier Park, um, Ann Fagri, who was working for Glacier at the time, I don't know if you know her, but she helped me tremendously on the information, uh, for example, Snyder, which we'll probably get to here, and 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 in the other things in Glacier Park. So she she went through what's called the Vought papers, B-A-U-G-H-T. There's Mount Vought, um, named after him, I think so, but he was the early historian of Glacier, and there's there's feet and feet and feet of files called the Vought Papers. And Ann Fagery helped me out a lot, finding relative ones to George Snyder and uh, Eddie Kruger and a lot of the old timers up the McDonald area. McDonald was, McDonald, uh, was the center of a, a very large social structure in the early days of the park. I mean, way before the mm. park, 19, 1894, I think is when Snyder knows homesteaded and then the Apgars and uh, Kelly's all homesteaded. And there's so many interesting stories from that. Um, so I got a lot of that out of the bot papers. Uh, of course, it was too long ago to interview. People were not really around to interview because they, it happened so long ago. But uh, yeah, so the bot papers, the Glacier Park has a good archives. You have to, yeah, you have to um, schedule a time to go and look at it. But I was lucky to have Ann Fagery. And then Lon Johnson, who was uh, the cultural, kind of like the anthrop cultural mm -hmm. uh, archeologist, he helped me a whole lot on where the things were located and how long ago and and you know and then Snyder's Snyder was married and divorced five times I got <laughs> I got I found his relatives um, and they sent me all kinds of stuff. In fact, when, when I started researching this Snyder story, <clears throat> there wasn't a single picture of George Snyder in the park archives, and he was the original owner of the lodge, McDonald Lodge, and the original owner of the park's headquarters area, and there was not one single picture. Now we've got quite a few because we were able to trace back to his his relatives and they had some pictures and i spent an awful lot of time on that uh snyder chapter it's the longest one in the book i think it's 40 or 50 pages and there's so much neat stuff about george <clears throat> well we better talk about it then but okay. let me let me just ask tell us a few of your favorite characters or favorite stories um i this could probably go on all night but i, yeah. I, I mean yeah. what stands out to you in all of this. Maybe I'll just pick one story, one quick story, so we don't uh, use a lot of time on that. Well, so George Snyder, <clears throat> he lived with my great aunt right next to my great aunt, because my great aunt owned the Stanton Creek Lodge in the late 20s and 30s. And that's only about 12 miles from West, from West Glacier. And George was the park service, spent a lot of time trying to get George, uh, George out of the park. He was a maverick. He he had really loud boats and he did things he wasn't permitted to do. He he did all kinds of stuff. And actually, he was smart because he kept beating the park service as lawyers. I mean, it was amazing. Mm. They kept trying to get him out of there because he would do all these violations. And so finally, they were able to get him out of there when he when he was going in excess of, I think, 12 miles an hour in his little Model A <laughs> and taking people to, from Belton to Apgar. And he didn't have a permit to do it. So they finally got him out. He went to jail. He got out. But what they had done earlier, though, is they had seized his boats that he was using. The park service, W.W. Payne, the supervisor, seized his boats, and it was an illegal, he, his lawyers figured out that it was illegal for them to do it because they were moored at Charlie Howe, if you've ever heard of Howe, Howe Ridge, or mm -hmm. the boat, Belt and Boatman, Charlie House, and it's H-O-W-E-S, by the way. Um, they were on his private land when they seized him. And so W.W. Payne, had was personally responsible for George's boats. And finally, they had to believe it, believe it or not, they had to pact 
uh, pass an act of Congress to reimburse W.W. Payne for the fine that he got when he took George's boats. So George took this $1,500 he had and just blew it, you know, right. kind of blew it. But and so he ended up indigent, indigent, indigent at my at my great aunt's a uh, little cabin outside my great aunt's. And she cared for him and gave him an apple pie when he went all winter without decent food. And, and so eventually, though, he he went into and worked for the Works Progress Administration back then during the, you know, the Depression time or not long after that. It was like a federal program. He fell off the back of a truck and he hit his head in Kalispell. And then he kind of disappeared out of sight. And my great aunt knew what happened, but she lied to me. She wouldn't tell me what happened because she was ashamed. And here's why she was ashamed. Because George Snyder was, they got a nurse and a doctor and he was interred into Warm Springs State Mental mm -hmm. Hospital. And he really wasn't, he, did, he was not an insane person. They, and, and, uh, and, and so he was railroaded into there. And Doris was, I figured out, she, she was ashamed to tell me that she allowed that to happen. And I know that she knew because I was chasing this around and Ace Powell made a mention of it in the parks archives where he was being interviewed. He said, yeah, I think George went to the insane asylum. And I thought, well, there's only one in Montana. So I called them and I said, did you, did you have a George Snyder there? He looked through his little, the same kind of thing. Looked through his, oh, no, we didn't. And they called back about a day later. Yeah, we did. But his records are at the Montana Historical Society because this was way back in 1940. So I called the West, the American, or the uh, Montana Historical Society. And I said, do you have a file on George Snyder? And she, a couple of days later, she calls back and says, yeah, we do have a file. I'll send, I'll, do you have any way of claiming a relative? Or, so I, I went back to his shirt tail relatives who were loaning us the photos and said, would you sign for this? Mm -hmm. And so I got the, I got this back and I figured, well, it probably won't be much in it. Yeah. So I got this folder, I open it up. George Snyder, and you can see where he was interred. And he looked really bad. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he was like, you know, like this and all that kind of, and it said, George Snyder, an insane patient. And then it went on to talk about his, where he came from, his mother, uh, all the different business adventures he had. He wasn't insane. He was, he was telling them all this stuff, but he got stuck there. And, and so he died four years later at that mental hospital. Nobody knew. I mean, nobody knew. And so I, but so then, then fast forward to get that folder from the, the society. And I opened up the second or third page was a letter on Stanton Creek Lodge letterhead from my great aunt to Warm Springs State Mental Hospital. So she did know what happened to him. She told me she didn't, you see. And, he, wow. and she was the only one that ever visited him there. Then they, they, they said to him, her and Dan, her husband, see, they said to him, to Doris, oh, he's crazy. He thinks he owned these big tourist camps in Glacier. She said, well, he did. He did. <laughs> he right? owned the Snyder Lodge and, and, the, and he had the, the headquarters. He had the park service by the, <clears throat> you know what, because he, he owned all that entire homestead land on a cash entry homestead that his dad bought for him. He had money behind him. And he owned a headquarters. <clears throat> and so Finally, he lost it, and actually, the first supervisor of Glacier, a mayor, uh, bought it and then gave it to the gave it to the park. So that's how they got their headquarters. But I guess as a favorite story, just and then and then so I call a historical society, <clears throat> or I mean the Warm Springs. I said, I know you had George there, and yeah, he <clears throat> he was kind of a helper for some of the patients. Mm -hmm. And I said, does he have a headstone? And the guy goes, There's thousands of people buried out here in this, in this these meadows, and there's no headstones. <clears throat> with names on. So I said, what if I get one? Will you help me put it there? They said, sure. Yeah, I thought they would. So Pete Darling made me a headstone for George <clears throat> here in Columbia Falls. And I drove out to Warm, you know, to Warm Springs and they drove me out over the, the prairie there. And as far as the eye could see, there's all these little twisted temporary markers. And they had counted the graves over in the number, number 16 or whatever. And they knew just where George is buried. So we put a headstone up for him. Really? So George has a headstone. That's where the, this dignitary really in Glacier Park is buried at Warm Springs. So wow. it's one of my favorite, favorite stories. Yeah. What a good thing you did for him and what yeah. a sad ending for, yeah. for him. Um, yeah. Wow. That's really, really interesting. Um, and, and what about, uh, I mean, that's, that's George as a character um, and, and a story, but are there other stories that sort of stand out to you? Um, 
I, I know the grizzly bear attack for me was that was that was really neat. <laughs> it's always interesting and you know that that penrose mauling you know everybody loves a great grizzly story right <clears throat> it's one of the best ones that i've ever seen so the penrose brothers were very um important politicians in pennsylvania uh boys penrose was a u.s senator uh cb penrose was a <clears throat> an expert on antiseptic surgery and published tons of papers about it. And then the other Penrose, the younger one, he ended up eventually getting the, the uh, uh, a lot of the development in, in Colorado going, like I can't remember, maybe the Pikes Peak Highway and the, oh, the Broadmoor. Mm -hmm. he, he established the Broadmoor, very important people. So they wanted to go along on a grizzly bear hunt because there was, uh, it was in 1907. Um, the US Geological Survey was going in to, uh, from, from the Middle Fork in Nyack Flats Real, right, right where Betty the Trapper lives and going up over the top and into the South Fork and, and they're surveying for glacier and for the Great Bear Wilderness or well for the forest, not it wasn't wilderness then. And, and so the Penrose brothers being very important, were able to tag along and somebody, you know, somebody from Congress must have called to the uh, geological survey and says, you know, take those guys up there and show them a good time. So they went up there and, and um, into the, into the, into the range there. And so Alfred uh, Al, uh, Stiles, Alfred Stiles, he was the lead surveyor and he wanted to show, of course, Boyce Penrose, the senator, a great time. Well, Boyce was too tired once he got up there. Mm, that's right. <laughs> but C.B. Penrose wasn't. And so he took C.B. Penrose over to this glacial basin, not far from where their camp is. And, you know, we had seen some deer and elk in here, you know, a few days ago. So let's try here, you know. So they separate and C.B. Penrose sees this very, what he called a white grizzly coming down this rock slide. And he shot at this white grizzly and killed it. It was a young, a small, a young one. And it came down into this boulder. You can tell right where it happened. It's the only, it's the only place that describes it there. And he went up to look at it and he took his knife out to start uh, cleaning it. And the, the adult stood up. And the adult, as soon as he saw him, he just charged full speed right across this little creek and knocked him into the creek, held him down, mauled the heck out of him, you know, and CB got a couple of shots off. Uh, and then finally, the bear bled enough that it kind of staggered across the creek and, and died. died. And well, so CB Penrose was in a world of hurt. And Stiles had heard the shooting. So he came over and he saw he saw Penrose staggering around all bloody and and he got and Penrose was pitifully saying water water so he got his cowboy hat filled with water and gave it to Penrose Penrose drank it but I don't know how to say this tastefully but there was there was it leaked right back out let's say oh. from some of the wounds and um, and so Styles was amazing he he got him on, on on his horse and he took him back to where the survey camp was which is a mile and a half of no trail and operated on him that night using Penrose's doctor kit because remember this is ironic he was an expert in antiseptic right. surgery <laughs> and so he's he asked stop both of his brothers wouldn't do it and he asked style to do it because he had bones sticking out and, and so they operated on him and wrapped him up and then they took him straight down rescue creek so when you drive up nyack creek i mean up nyack and you go past um where josephine lived and where betty the trapper lived and there's a creek that comes down called Rescue Creek. And that's the, the creek they brought C.B. Penrose down. And then they took him back east on the railroad. And that was 1907. And then so he was he was beholden to Alfred Stiles for saving his life. And after that, he gave him a commemorative firearm or whatever. So to me, that was one of the best grizzly stories I, I, I heard. And that was Gordon Poliot, an old timer up the Middle Fork, that told me the story and got me uh, tied in to someone that knew about it. And then I found that actually Stiles wrote an, a story, an article about it in the uh, um, National Geographic. Oh. And then, and, and then uh, Penrose wrote his own version in um, Boone and Crockett. And so I used those two versions and tried to tell the story. And then, so that's, that's the grizzly story. <laughs> I don't know if it qualifies as showing them a good time, but it <laughs> certainly was an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew, it looks like we have another comment maybe in the chat, and then maybe we can do a couple of giveaways with some trivia <clears throat> questions. Yeah, we had a comment from Kristen, and maybe, Kristen, you want to just unmute and share this story? 
Okay. Yes, my dad's with me tonight, and we grew up in Kalispell and in the surrounding area. And a long time ago, they went to look for property. Uh, they ended up on uh, Lake Five, but or near Lake Five, but they were looking for property up the Middle Fork, and turns out the neighbor was Doris Hafim. And so they all, they didn't buy the property next to the Huffings, but they had some good conversations, he says. Okay, yeah, um, that, that connection. my wife's great aunt and uncle. Yeah. Thanks That's for sharing nice that, Kristen. Eight. Where do you live now? I'm, uh, we're in Ellensburg, Washington. And do you still make it back to Glacier to visit or to the Flathead? Oh yeah, I was, this year I was only there once. Last year when I was there four times. It's only 450 miles, so that's it's great. It. It's an easy trip, isn't it? Well, thank yes. you for joining us and sharing sharing your story. Super interesting. If anyone else has something they want to share, please feel free. Um, all right, I think I think it's. Give, oh, go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say we have one more quick question from Carl and Candy. Um, it's kind of a fun one. If you imagine um, one day Lake McDonald is is totally drained. Uh, what kinds of things might be discovered in the, the dry lake bed there? <laughs> they read the book, didn't they? <clears throat> well, um, McDonald's, the, the deepest um, big lake in Glacier Park, is shaped like a banana split boat. It's got more water than all the other lakes in Glacier Park put together, other large lakes. <clears throat> and there's a great story there about George Snyder. George Snyder owned the Snyder, uh, the, uh, uh, called the Glacier Hotel then, the uh, it's, it was, it is now the uh, McDonald Creek Lodge, McDonald Lake Lodge. And he had a boat and he called it, do you remember? Well, he basically named the boat after the chief of outreach for the Great Northern, you know, trying to appeal to the touristy thing there. And, uh, and so that boat was docked one night after the, the uh, cattle queen of Montana and um, a couple of other people that were involved in this mining operation uh, Uncle Jeff was one of their names, and and they had they argued all day long, and and an old uh, uh, cranky McPartland, who the name uh, the peak right near the Glacier Park uh, mo mo or the McDonald Hotel, uh, he was trying to get a whiskey bottle, a whiskey jug, from the Cattle Queen of Montana, and they were in this boat and they were paddling back to where the the private entries still are in in at the mouth of McDonald Creek there from the lodge. And well, the boat turned over and the, uh, the cattle queen was able to hold on to the boat with her brother Chan and, and uh, McPartland drowned, he went down. Now, McDonald Lake is extremely deep. It's 480 feet, I think it is. And it's, it's, hyper, uh, it, it's hyper cooled. In other words, usually, if any of you know, the, 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 the maximum density of water is four degrees centigrade. So about 39 degrees. So you get a big deep lake, lake like that, and it's 39 degrees year round down there. Well, Flathead Lake, just talking to the biological station people, <clears throat> is, I mean, McDonald Lake in that deep hole is, is hyper, hyper cold. And so it's so cold that there's probably almost no decomposition down there. And the silt level in McDonald Creek, if you've ever been up McDonald Creek, you know, it doesn't ever get silty, really. I mean, it'll get brown for a few days, but it's pretty clear. So the silt levels is, is not very uh, deep either. So if you drained McDonald Lake, <laughs> or if you got a submarine that could, that had a camera and you look, cause it was old, it was 250 yards, something like that, right off of the, of the dock there where the, dis, the dismet is now. Uh, McPartland's gotta be laying down there because he had all this heavy stuff on like a pistol and mining gear and all that. And, and, the boot, the uh, the cattle queen watched him kind of his body kind of go like that when it floated down, and so he probably landed on his back. And he's probably still laying there with his eye sockets staring up. So, if that's what you meant, thanks for asking that question. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, let's let's do a giveaway. It looks like there's another question that popped in there, and and maybe a comment. Um, but we've got th we've got three giveaways, so we better get at it. Um, I have a few questions to choose from here, um, and I've, I've sort of been reduced to a, a floating head, but I kind of like this one <laughs> that way. <laughs> the focus is John, anyhow. Um, and some of these have been answered uh, earlier in their conversation. So uh, Betty the Trapper was born and grew up along the Middle Fork on the boundary of Glacier. 
what tragic accident happened to her when she was only three? And I would say the first person to put the answer in the chat, we will, there we go. Miss, Miss Margaret Notley, um, one of our wonderful board members here at the Glacier Conservancy, um, answered correctly that her finger was shot off. Um, Margaret, why don't you unmute and give us your choice? Would you like Wild Rivers Pioneers, the book? Would you like John's other book, Rangers, Trappers, and Trailblazers, or A Glacier T-shirt? The Fox shirt. Um, is, is the Glacier T-shirt my favorite Fox one? Um, I, I have Wild River Pioneers, so um, maybe, what, what's the T-shirt? It is the Fox one, you are correct. I don't know if I can get the T-shirt. It's my favorite T-shirt ever, so I, I think, um, I'm pretty sure I have a copy of John's book. My house flooded and my books are in the garage, so I'm not sure, but I'll take the t-shirt. How about that? That sounds great, Margaret. Thanks for okay. joining us tonight. This is the, large. Thanks the for show this. That's the other book, Rangers, Trappers, and Trailblazers. It has four. Actually, could I have the book instead? I don't have it. I would recognize the cover. I'm sorry. Well, don't, no, you know, don't, may, don't worry. I won't feel bad if you choose a t-shirt over. No, no, I, I have a couple of shirts. I really would like the book. I have so much enjoyed reading this one. Yes, please. Yeah. All right, so we'll Mar send that one. Margaret is a reader. If I know anything about her, she is a reader. So um, I, I bet she will enjoy the book. I think you'll really like this, this book. It was published Excellent. in 2018. Okay. And while I'm unmuted, can I ask you my question, which I didn't put in the chat? Yeah. Okay, so so you you cross the river and you go up Harrison Creek and then you come out at the lake. Is that right? Have you been there? Have you done that route before? That where the hidden cabin is up along that ridge there somewhere. Yeah. Well, if you've done that, then you've seen the du Duty Homestead. It's right at the Boundary Trail and Harrison Creek uh, Harrison Lake Trail junction. Okay. Hey, have but you the seen cabin that where he sobered her up is, is and the ruins oh, of that. That's way up the ridge, uh, towards okay. more towards Harrison Creek on the other side of Harrison Creek and then up the ridge. Okay. Yeah, but you're in the right ballpark there. Yeah. Wouldn't it be Beautiful. fun to wander around with John? <laughs> if only I could. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure I can. Well, the one time I took the park service and all those people in there, I got us lost <laughs> shortly and we, briefly was we were wandering around trying to find. The bootleg lady spring and i'd been there many times and to me it was just one of the other weird things that happened in there where she kind of turned me around finally chaz cartwright said because i kept trying to you know i kept apologizing he said stop apologizing <laughs> so we finally found found uh, got back to the homestead but anyway bethany just asked if that's going to be a giveaway to wander around with john maybe in the future <laughs> you bethany. wouldn't want that <laughs> <laughs> i love it uh, let's see, let's do what, let's do another giveaway while we're here. Um, okay. Again, in the chat, uh, Dan duty was one of Glacier's first Rangers. When was he officially hired to begin his service and who hired him? It was a tough one. Can anybody answer either of those? Oh, oh, it's close. Uh, the red year is correct. Okay. I think we better give it to Mary Kate for getting one out of two. Um, but so the year was close. Yeah, 1910 is when the actual uh, Glacier Park was administered. Um, uh, Logan was the was was the name the first superintendent. It was it was August of uh, 2010. I think it's August 8th of 2010. And then there were and then there was Henry Hutchings, poor Henry Hutchings, who had a 20 year battle with Snyder and his lawyers. Um, he was he was the assistant superintendent, and then in, in August 12th, 1910, they appointed six rangers, and one of them was Dan Duty, and his is the only one that has a date, and it's August 12th, 2010. Some of the others were Joe Cosley, Dad Ram, you know, they were all a bunch of outlaws that they appointed as rangers because they knew the country and they were tough, and you know. And you said Mather. Mather was, uh, you know, the Park Service. He was the first, I believe, the, he was the director of the Park Service when when he bought and then gifted the headquarters area uh, from George Schneider to, to Glacier Park. And there's even, a, a, there's a road right there by the headquarters uh, named Mather Lane. Steve, Stephen Mather. Yeah. Thanks, Mary-Kate, for, for chiming in there. Um, do you wanna chat us or uh, unmute and let us know if you'd like the Wild Rivers Pioneers, copy of that book. Um, I'm sure that John would sign it for you. 
um, and, or a glacier. Well, I already bought that one for this evening. <laughs> the t-shirt. Excellent. Excellent. We'll be in touch about the t-shirt. Thanks for joining us tonight. Let's see if I have one more that we haven't <clears throat> touched on. Um, I guess true or false. Josephine duty was uh, a bootlegger across the middle fork of the Flathead River in Glacier. True or false? Should be a pretty easy one for anyone who's read the book. True, true, true. Not quite sure. True, true, true. And 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 John's follow up was what was this ever proven or more of a legend? Legend. Yeah. What do people think about that? Oh, this could go on for a while. Ruben question mark? Yeah, Bethany says no, she wasn't, and a legend. It was all legend. It's not Alexander. Alexandra said proven, question mark. Was she ever caught? Proven, says that's, Mary Kate. That's right. You want to elaborate on that, John? Yeah, well, a lot of times you hear, oh, they were a bootlegger. She was an absolute documented bootlegger who got busted by the Park Service. And I've got the, the journal entry with 18 and a half gallons of moonshine and a whole bunch of mash and different uh, jugs. And one of the Park Service friends of hers in the Nyack Valley there that actually may have been helping her had to pretend like he was going to help the revenuers uh, buster and so they actually busted her and it's all I think it's all in the book but I have the I have the actual journal entry of the ranger he listed all the different and they she had some deer hides out there too at her place <laughs> when they went and checked it. and uh and so she was a document you hear a lot about bootleggers and a lot of its legend but she was documented as being a big time moonshiner yep and I didn't see who answered first Andrew, do you have that? And yes, she was rated. See that where she was that. rated. And that's all left listed in there. I think Lisa Parker was our the first to get that answer in. Lisa, thank you for chiming in. We're going to send you a book, Wild River Pioneers. Maybe if you already have it, you could gift it to somebody and we'll have John sign it um, before we send it off to you. So <laughs> what, a, what a special copy. Thank you. I actually don't have the book. I had to get my copy from the library. <laughs> <laughs> well, so wonderful. So that much. worked out. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And thanks for joining us tonight. Andrew, was there one other question or comment up above? Yeah, there was one more question in the chat. Uh, it's from Stephen Raymond. Uh, do you have any stories about the explorer and mountaineer Norman Clyde who visited Glacier in the 20s and 30s? Norman I've read Clyde. About, a lot about Norman Clyde in, in, uh, in Edward's climbing book. And he was a uh, one of the top, if not the top, climber in the early days. But I never, I didn't do anything on on him. Um, I did want to mention one more thing about about uh, Josephine, though. And you know, we had talked about spirituality, and and uh, there was two things that happened with Josephine. That, and I don't know how much time we have left, but uh, I think we have ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, so I just got kind of tired of all these weird things happening with Josephine, and. Um, it, it just seemed, didn't seem explainable, you know. So in, I think it was night, it was in 2018, 2019, 2019, maybe. Uh, I rounded up my daughter and then I rounded up a colleague at FECC who is an expert on um, how people view the world. He had a PhD and traveled all over the world. And, and, we, and we, we went across the river to try to figure out if we could connect with Josephine somehow. And we took along a Ouija board. Cool. <laughs> if you know what a Ouija board is. And we got over there and I had a list of questions to ask that only Josephine would know. Like, what county were you really born in in Georgia? And things like that. And what was the real date that you died? Because she lied about her her uh, her age. And so it moved the planchette, what's called a planchette. It moved all around and everything, but we never could put together a uh, understandable response, response from her. So, so that's how desperate I was because Pete Darling called me one night 
when we were going through all this and he said, is this John Fraley? I said, Pete, we've known each other for 10 years and we talk a lot. Yeah, of course. He said, are you the one that wrote this bootleg lady of Glacier Park? I said, yeah, you helped me and all that. You know, he said, well, I, I have no explanation. I found a copy of a, a draft manuscript and it says John Fraley bootleg lady. And I said, well, that sounds like the one I was, you know, getting reviewed by different people for my original 1990 article of True West. He said, well, I've got it right here. So I drove over and I took a picture of him holding this manuscript. And I said, and we said, where did you find it? And, he, and if you read in the book, you'll see he found it. His, his dear wife died before he did. He died in 2015, I think it was. And he was cleaning out her drawer. He, and so he's cleaning out her dresser, the bottom drawer of her dresser. And that was in it. Now, I didn't, I, it, that's, so that's 15 years before I met Peter, knew anything about him. What was it doing in the bottom of her dresser? Wow. So I'll leave that question to you because it's, I've got a picture of him holding it. And it was no like, it was no thing like, well, Pete maybe took the review. No, there was only a few copies of it. Doris sure. reviewed it. A couple of newspaper people I had reviewing it, but there was absolutely no explanation for that eerie uh, occurrence. Well, well, this is going to lead me to my next question <laughs> okay. because I think it's <clears throat> super interesting that you are so interested in sort of the spiritual side of things um, because one of the questions that we had discussed is, do you consider yourself a writer, a historian, or a scientist? And listening to you talk about Lake McDonald, clearly you're a scientist. Um, and, and clearly those others seem to ring true. Um, but what's your answer? To well, that? and I would encourage, I'll bet you if we have, you know, how many other people we have on, I'll bet you that a good number of them have either written a book or want to write a book. Um, and I would encourage you, you don't have to be uh, Hemingway to write a book. I mean, I use my strengths as a scientist and researcher to gather all this information and then work to put it in an entertaining way, even though I'm more of a scientist than I am a writer or an historian. And so it came to me through science and, um, and then it just kind of blossomed from there. I've, I've got my fifth book coming out in a couple months. And it just seems like if you really heavily research it and you get everything as correctly as you can and you, and you emote with the, the character and you, you trust your characters and uh, care a lot about them, it comes through. You know? So I don't know how I'd answer that anymore, but uh, it kind of got me going. The science is what got me started because I was a biologist up there and I'd see this cabin. I go, that cabin looks at least 70 years old or 100 years old. What's the story of that? You know, and, I, and I just start asking myself these questions. and, and so that's about the best way I guess I can answer that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's super interesting. I've been I've been wanting to hear the answer to that, but I, I had a feeling it was it was a little bit of everything. Kind of nebulous answer. But. Right, right. Um, so so we talked about you know some of the stories that stood out to you, but are there some that bothered you? Well, that would just be the only one that really bothered me. Well, when Betty, poor Betty got her finger shot off. But uh, the only one that really bothered me was the Lena Cunningham was very brutal. Yeah. And in the book, you know, I pretty much used the, the actual facts that I, I, I softened it a little bit, but it, was, it never was explained why she would do it. She had some of her kids, why it would happen. She had some of her kids presents that she bought when she walked to Columbia Falls that day and they were spread around the tracks where she was killed. Uh, there was no assault as far as a, you know, sexual assault that they, they, they determined that. And I don't think, I think they didn't, she did, they didn't even take the money that she had in her purse because she was picking up her husband's paycheck or something or pay. But it could be too that somebody surprised or they, they heard something and, and the, the murderer ran off. But that one really bothered me. Um, but before I forget it, one of the things that, you know, when Betty shot her finger off, was, was I was able to recoup some of that because, so John Schur, her husband, who I profiled in, in Rangers Trappers Trailblazers, he was a trapper. Um, he came to me and in, in um, right after she died and in, in 2015, Betty. And see, Betty and I were kindred spirits because we used to, we hiked a lot of the same areas and did a lot of the same stuff. Uh, she died at age 90 in 2015. And he came to me and said, you know, uh, what Betty really wanted is she wanted her ashes spread on Great Northern Mountain. And Great Northern, if you know, or if you just look over from Glacier, you see sort of dominates that whole thing. And she wanted you to do it. 
I said, oh, well, <laughs> I don't know. It's a 5,000 feet and five miles, but I mean, I don't know if I, I feel like I'm close enough to the family to do it, although I'm fairly close to the family. And, and he said, well, we'd be, we'd really wish you would. And so my son and I in 2018, we, we hiked up to the top of Great Northern Mountain and got, you know, there's kind of a little dicey spot right on top. You get, I'd recommend everybody do Great Northern. It's a terrific climb, but you got to be in, you got to be with it to do it, you know, really ready because it's, it's really super steep. But, uh, and we looked over the edge of the mountain, there was a goat sitting on the snow field. So yeah, this is a perfect place to spread Betty's ashes. So we had, you know, a portion of her ashes or whatever. And we, I took up a couple of uh, excerpts from the book that I had blown up and set them around there and took a picture for the family and yeah, took them out with me, of course. And we spread these ashes and uh, right, right by the goat. <laughs> and so I felt like I kind of was able to serve Betty and her family in a little bit because I was, because after she got her finger shot off, the poor little thing, think of a three-year-old girl in an accident getting her finger shot off and her mother, I, and I, I was the owner of a copy of Betty's baby book. So I'd, I'd encourage all you mothers out there to keep a baby book. You probably do. But, and uh, she started stuttering after it happened. And her mother would uh, make her stop talking when she started. You know, back then mm -hmm. they had these weird ways. They tried to stop stuttering. And I'm trying to imagine her going through that for a few years. Poor little thing. And she did eventually stop stuttering. She was a very, very assertive woman when I knew her. <laughs> and and uh, so I guess that's in a roundabout way of saying I was able to kind of remedy one of the things that, that you know, bothered me. Sure. Wait, what closure you've provided for some of these, these families or, or um, sort of just tied up some loose ends. So it, it, maybe that's an, a result of the book that mm -hmm. you didn't expect. Well, um, I, I hear from so many people that say, you know, like the other day, the book I wrote with the, uh, with the, I think it was in Heroes of the Bob Marshall Wilderness that I wrote in 2020. I was skiing up uh, Heron Park and <clears throat> this one lady said, oh, you're John Fraley. He said, did you know that you wrote a story about my dad in there? And that I cried when I read it because wow. I didn't know anything about it. Her dad was a, I'm not giving anything away because I'm not saying names. Her dad was a pilot, a backcountry pilot. And he, he helped save the lives of a couple of people that crashed at my spotted bear because he was such a good pilot. He flew in at night, like headlights on the, on the or not headlights, just beams on the, on the airstrip. Sure. And I didn't know that this was her dad. She didn't you know, know I wrote the book and she just happened to be reading along and read, here's a story of her dad who saved somebody's life. And one of the guys that was saved <clears throat> or knew a lot about it was a very, prominent person that I won't mention in the Valley and said something like he was a heck of a pilot. And she got to read that just unexpectedly. Sure. And it was really kind of touching. And she said she started crying when she read it because she learned something new about her father that yeah. she didn't know. He died. He died when she was only three or four years old. Wow. Yeah. So. Wow. And, and the stories go on. I'm yeah. Sure. I mean, you go forever because um, like a lot of times, oh, that was my my brother's aunt that you're talking about, you know right, what I mean? Right. It I just go, it just, yeah. it just goes, the connections are endless. They're just endless. That's what takes so long to, to write the book. Sure. Sure. One leads to another. And I, I got my next book coming out in a month and a half and it's called, here's, here's the flyer on it. A shamelessly, uh, you if you can see, see it. I don't know. Maybe if you get a little closer. Oh. <laughs> well, I shouldn't <laughs> even be hawking it anyway. But it's, it's called my wilderness life. And it's, uh, it's a lot about just my life in the wilderness and all the stories I found. And then about a, a person that died when he was only 19. It was my companion in the wilderness. And now he lived a short life. I lived a long wilderness life. And I try to make meaning of that. And then there's different adventure stories about the wilderness too. So that, that, that should come out November 14th. Wonderful. Well, something for us all to look forward to. Um, John, we so appreciate your time. And this has just been such a a fun night. It really could continue forever. Um, and not only have you made a huge difference in this valley and in the park, but all of the people that joined us tonight too. Thank you for your support um, throughout the years. And if some of you are new to Glacier Book Club, we're so glad that you're here and I hope that you'll join us in the future. We try to do these every um, every other month. And then the opposite months, we do Glacier Conversations, um, which are uh, stories of Glacier and sort of 
beyond. Um, so I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. John, again, thank you. Um, and we will see you next month at Glacier Conversations. And if you want a book plate signed by John, uh, send an email to grace at glacier.org and she'll hook you up with a signed plate for your book.